Hey, what's up everyone? Jason Turley here. It's late at night and I've been watching some Coding Jesus, which is a YouTuber and he makes a lot of interviews around programming and software development. And one series of videos he does is actually mock interviews where people will call in and he'll just give them uh, usually just fundamental and basic computer science and low level memory management uh, interview questions. And it kind of motivated me to kind of look up some interview questions of my own. So I was on Reddit, like, hey, what are some of the most asked embedded systems interview questions? Because that's something I myself want to get into doing more low level programming in C and working with um, microcontrollers and things like that. And I was scrolling down and I saw this post here, this comment here saying, we always ask, what does the volatile keyword do? And I've seen this interview question a lot, so much so I kind of thought it was a meme or a joke or, you know, they can't really be serious because at least personally, I didn't think this keyword was that much of a gotcha or that tricky, but I guess it can be if you've never used it before or you're not too familiar with it, or maybe there's some misinformation out there about it. So I kind of wanted to dispel some of the myths about what this volatile keyword is and when you might want to use it if you are programming in C. So if you're just doing regular, uh, I guess, C programming, what does that even mean? But if you're not really working with multi-threaded code or anything to do with concurrency or embedded systems, maybe you don't even need to use the volatile keyword, but essentially all it is, uh, so you know what volatile means, right? If you're familiar with stocks and there's a stock or an asset that's volatile, it means the price can fluctuate rapidly, kind of like cryptocurrency, right? It fluctuates rapidly, it's out of control. Um, in the sense of the C programming language and compilers and things like that, the volatile keyword essentially means uh, you're telling the compiler, hey, this value, this data, it's likely going to change. Like we need to know what the value is. It's, it's uh, probably going to change. Um, and this comes into play with multi-threaded code where uh, different threads share a stack and they're trying to access that same critical resource, that same data. Maybe one is trying to read a piece of information while the other one is trying to write to it. So you're telling the compiler essentially not to do optimizations. Now, maybe that made no sense in a few moments here. I will get into a demo uh, because sometimes I get, I stumble over my words and things like that. So here on the GNU.org website, we have a uh, documentation about the volatile keyword and saying here, hey, the GNU C compiler often performs optimizations that eliminate the need to write or read a variable. For instance, if you have this segment of code where you declare an integer called foo, you assign it the number one, and then you increment, increment it with the plus plus operator. So the value will store two. However, um, the compiler might look at this and say, wait a minute, we assign foo the value of one, and then we immediately increment it. All this plus plus means is you add one to it, effectively making it two. The compiler might say, wait, there's no need for this to ever be one because we're not really doing anything with this information. Why don't we just make it two right away? Why don't we save time and skip assigning it the value of one and then incrementing it? Let's just go right ahead and assign it the value of two right off the bat. So this is fine if your code only has one thread, like the main thread of execution. However, if you're doing multi-threaded code and things like that, um, and you need mutual exclusion, these kind of optimizations uh, could be detrimental to the program and the way things are supposed to operate. So using the volatile keyword is one way to prevent this compiler optimization. And they go into more, a little bit more detail here about uh, using a lock but that's enough like intro out of the way. I honestly just wanted an excuse to open up Vim and start coding a little bit of snippets in C. So here I have two programs or two source uh, files, one called foo.c and the other called the volatile foo.c. If we look at this or we inspect it in Vim, just so we have a little bit of syntax highlighting, uh, we see here is that same code snippet from 
the website and I made a little comment saying a compiler might optimize this and store two inside of foo instead of one. So let's actually look at this. So first I will compile it with GCC. Let's uh, cat it out. I actually have that here. We're gonna make two binaries and we're gonna compile it again. And this time give it the O2 flag or the optimization level two flag. So now I can do an LS and I can even, if I want to do a diff of foo and foo um, underscore optimize two, and we see that these are different. So let's actually disassemble this. If you want, you can look at it in object dump or your favorite disassembler. Hey, I just like using GDB. So I'm going to open up here and I do have the pwn debug extension uh, that comes into play for binary exploitation and CTF challenges, but it will also give us some nice syntax highlighting and it automatically uses the much better Intel syntax instead of the AT&T syntax, which is horrendous. So looking at the dump of the main program, it only has a handful of assembly instructions and opcodes. So we can like look through this pretty quickly. We see the base pointer is being uh, set up and saved onto the stack. Cool. And then we see at the very end uh, that base pointer is being popped and being stored in the stack pointer again, and then we're returning. Cool. But what we care about right here is this chunk in the middle. These three lines I have highlighted here. We see the value one is being stored inside of this local variable. So local variables, at least in X64, that's the architecture for this, can be accessed as offsets from the base pointer. Integers are four bytes in size. So that is why we are uh, doing an offset of minus four and we're storing the number one. And then we see we add one to it here. So effectively foo equals two. And then in uh, C we have int main. I didn't explicitly say return zero, but the compiler will just make it return zero anyway, because it is int main. So it does need to have a return of an integer. If you don't tell it return zero, it will, um, I guess, assume our return zero on its own. Sweet, pretty cool. So we see the value zero is stored in the register EAX and X64 and X86. The return value is stored in EAX by convention. It doesn't have to be, but that's just the way it is for this. And then we return. So we're essentially uh, declaring foo right here. We're adding one to it and then we're returning the number zero. Cool. So let's, now let's look at the optimized, um, um, the optimized elf file or um, object file. We'll do the same exact thing. We will disassemble the main function and look at that. Look how smaller this code is, right? We're not even setting up the uh, base pointer. It's called the function prologue where we do the push of the base pointer RPP and we're not doing the pop at the end. We're not um, using any local variables or anything like that. Honestly, I should quit out of this, open this up inside of tmux and now rerun it. So GDB, let's do foo, disassemble main. And then I can open up a new tab and disassemble uh, foo02. Oops. Uh, GDB, disassemble main. So now we can have these side by side. There we go. So now all we're doing is saying, hey, the return value is going to be stored in the register EAX. We don't even need to set it to zero with a move instruction. We can be creative. We can be crafty and we can just simply XOR it. Because when you XOR a value by itself, you're essentially setting it to zero. And we won't get into the bit manipulation in this video, but essentially we're setting the return value to zero and then we're calling the return instruction. So look at the difference, right? So this is kind of neat and we're not even using the volatile keyword yet. I just wanted to get a, get a, uh, a point across. So this is our unoptimized code. This is just feeding it to the compiler regularly and this is our optimized code. So let's make a new pane. Let's do an LS. Let's review our volatile foo function. 
So it's the exact same as that example from before. If I go back to this web page, it's the exact same example here, but this time I just added the volatile keyword in front of it. And once again, we will compile it with no optimizations and then with uh, level two optimizations and we'll see what the differences are there. So I'm just going to do a quick head. I can't even spell. So I can easily just copy and paste this and slam it into my command line. So let's do the same thing with this optimized one. Uh, when I pasted this one in, it had a little space in front of it. So this is kind of just like a little tip or trivia. If you have a space in bash, when you um, enter a command, it won't be available in your uh, history when you hit the up arrow. So you see when I hit the up arrow, it just goes to this. Same thing if I do an LS or like a uh, who am I? I'm adding a space in front of all of it. So it's not getting added to my bash history. No idea why that is not related to the video. I just thought that was kind of neat. So let's look at volatile foo in our disassembler. And once again, you can do object dump or Ghidra or uh, Ida Pro or anything like that. I just like using GDB. So this is our unoptimized code with a volatile keyword. And let's compare it to this. So if you look here at the bottom of my, um, my Tmux panes down here, they all say GDB. The cool thing of Tmux is you can rename things. So let's say foo, and let's name this one um, foo optimized or foo02, just so I can kind of easily keep track of what is what. So this is the original foo unoptimized, and here's the one with the volatile keyword. If I could just kind of quickly toggle back and forth between them, we see they are very, very similar. For whatever reason, um, the volatile one will store the value one inside that local variable, and then it takes that local variable and it assigns it to EAX. So I don't know why we're getting this register involved here, and then we add one to EAX, and then we store EAX inside of that local variable. Whereas here, without the volatile keyword, we do everything in just that local variable. I'm not sure why we're using a temp register here. And then we set EAX to zero and we return zero. Interesting, I don't know why. So let's look at the final example, GDB volatile foo optimized o2 and let's disassemble that main function once again and it is volatile um and that is again it's just telling the compiler hey this variable is probably important do not optimize it do not change the code um, for this particular variable so here for volatile we see there is no there is a little bit of optimizations being done but the value uh, foo, or our local variable, is not being optimized away. So if I come back here, we can see the function prolog, right? The pushing and the setting the stack pointer equal to the base pointer, and then popping the base pointer at the end. In the optimized code, we're not even doing that. Instead of um, putting the base pointer, so this is called setting up a stack frame, instead of pushing the base pointer onto the stack, we're just directly using the stack pointer as an offset. I don't know if you notice that, right? We have RSP here. If I go back to this other one, it's RBP. This is the base pointer and this is the stack pointer. Two very important special reserved registers, especially if you're trying to do any type of exploit development, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. So we're setting it equal to one. Again, we're using a temp register like EAX to do the arithmetic. And then we store EAX back into our uh, local variable. We set EAX equal to zero, and then we return. Cool, that was a lot. Hopefully that made a little bit of sense. 
it seems like this is a very, very common interview question. So, hey, maybe I didn't explain this the best way, but I do encourage you uh, to kind of just play around with things. Just open up a disassembler in your favorite text editor of choice and just start programming little code snippets and looking at the actual uh, disassembly and the output. If you don't want to actually use your own compiler, you can come to a website called Godbolt, uh, godbolt.org. And this is really neat as well. It's called a compiler explorer. And you can set your language. They have um, a ton of high level, quote unquote, high level programming languages. I'm just going to use C. And then you can set exactly what architecture you want. By default, I just uses this square function that takes one parameter and then it essentially multiplies it by itself. It takes a square of it. So you can look at what the actual disassembly looks like in x64 or if you want something different you can look at it in arm or any other computer architecture right 32-bit 64-bit whatever floats your boat so we can see the differences so this is a great way so if you do want a low-level programming job something to do with embedded systems something to do with like network programming and socket programming it, these are some of the fundamental concepts that i guess interviewers are looking for I do need to look through more of um, these Reddit interview questions. And once again, uh, highlight and kudos and shout out to Coding Jesus. I've just started following him. Let me actually subscribe. I'm not even subscribed to the dude. And he does a lot of good work for the community is what it looks like. If you're interested in programming, it seems like his background is mainly C, C++, and some Python. So that's really it for this video. Um, I just, like I said, wanted an excuse to fire up uh, Vim and GDB and play around with C a little bit. Because I know we don't do a ton of programming on this channel, but it is always a good time when we can uh, look at these kind of things like this. So that's it, guys. As always, take it easy, and I'll see you in the next video.